Excellent. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I am good. Thank you for agreeing to chat with me today. I think this is going to be a very interesting chat. So may I please ask you your name? Yes, my name is Ken Granderson. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ken. And may I call you Ken? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Anything you feel comfortable sharing with an audience? Wow, that's a, like such an open-ended question. Well, it is my favorite month of the year, Black History Month. Um, you know, and and part of it, part of the reason why it's my favorite is that this is the month when um, more people than normal pay attention to being black and um, take take pride in it, and you know, pay attention to things that have going on in the past that have led us to where we are today. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm just psyched. I look forward to February. <laughs> so, um, why, why do you look forward to February? What's special to you about February? Well, for a good portion of my life, uh, actually half my life, I've focused on creating technologies that quote, uplift the race, um, you know, black oriented technologies and a lot of that has focused around history. Um, actually, back in 1995, um, I digitized a book on Boston's Black history and was trying to get into the public school system um, because I, I'm a technologist. I'm a nerd. I've been like, you know, creating tech for 30 years now, and I discovered something that I believe is pretty much unknown to most folks, which is that. Technology is a wide open opportunity where you can do whatever you want. And I say that because one of the things that I've seen, directions I've seen the technology industry shift to is one where um, I don't see folks like myself who are tech entrepreneurs. You know, so back in the day, I had a company called Inner City Software. T-shirt is in the back over my shoulder, which is a euphemism for black software company. And this is in Boston in the 1990s. And with the team of myself and three other developers, we put Boston's black communities online. You know, we put the empowerment zone online. Um, afterward, a decade or so later, I single-handedly created um, the website that, uh, for the government of St. Lucia, put that online. And today, while we have tens and tens of thousands of black folks in the tech space, because I'm in forums that have 11,000 people. It seems like no one is, has any concept of doing anything except trying to get a job. Yeah. And while I, I say I got a bunch of sayings, and while one of them is that Black folks with jobs beats Black folks without jobs, in my view, 25 hours a day, eight days a week, it's not going to change the balance of power in the industry. And, we're, and tech, the tech industry is wide open. It literally doesn't require anything but your time, in many cases, to create something and put it out there and learn how to provide services. I taught myself, and my com the company I was working for wasn't willing to do tuition reimburse. I said, okay, no problem, I'll do it on my own. And you know, just the level of opportunity that's possible from pure nothing but self-determination, and no one has gotten in my way. Um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so the the history angle is so important to me because I understand that unless you know that you stand on the shoulders of giants, it's easy to see yourself low down. So another saying is when you know that you stand on the shoulders of giants, it's easier to see yourself from a higher place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all cultures have great successes and pioneers or whatever, but we don't know about the black ones. And and a lot of that, you know, we're at a time where in certain parts of the US, there's suppression about black history and this and that. And, and a lot of folks are upset about that. I don't get upset about that. I What I say is, so you're telling me you thought that the same kind of folks that bought and sold you a hundred years ago are gonna teach you about your power? How's that working out for you? Well, I've never expected other folks to do that for us. I've always accept, felt that we had to do it on our own. And so, yeah, so for 20, 1997, it's funny, yeah, yeah. So thanks to calculators, most of us have forgotten how to do math, myself, even though, you know, 
I did a lot of math. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so in 97, since 97, I've run blackfacts.com. Um, you know, set it up initially as the world, it's the world's first black history search engine. We set it up initially as something to try to get the black community interested in this new thing called the internet. Um, because when it comes to different innovations and different opportunities, so many of us, I believe, have been so conditioned to not think that these new things and these great things are for us. So, I, you know, Black Facts started as a, 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 a way to try and say, hey, this internet thing, you're in it too. Um, and you know, my longtime friend and business partner, Dale Dowdy, a few years ago, we decided to try to make it into something more than that and make it into a business. And um, after some st stops and starts trying to figure out what to do, we've started getting um, digital Black history into schools. And so I'm, I'm really psyched that as of right now, we are in nine states and, you know, focusing on the other 50, you know. Excellent. Yeah, so there's a lot in there to unpack, but I want to start by 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 starting a little bit about you. So you were not a technologist by trade. You made yourself a technologist. Oh no, no, no. Definitely a technologist by trade. Um okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Um got interest got in um in introduced to computers in my late teens. This was in the late 70s, though. You know, there was no way that um, my family could afford one. So I got into audio stuff and DJing and, you know, ended up um, being really into, into that. You know, I did go to MIT thinking that I was going to do computer science, but the nerds were so scary. I said, oh, this DJ thing is kind of cool. So I did electrical engineering. You know, I didn't pick up computer until a decade later, close to a decade after graduating. No, not a decade. No, it was only about seven years after graduating. And, you know, I was I was doing software testing, not programming. So, um, yes, yeah, so when I decided to start doing programming, that's when I had to do it on my own. You know, read some, bought, bought and read some books, practiced and, you know, made some different programs and got a couple out there that um, made enough money for me to quit my job. And, you know, so, mm -hmm. and actually the fact that I was selling a programs in other countries, including South Africa in 1992, those, those were some of the things that really like blew my mind um, about the opportunity as well as in um, a book that one of my programs got put into, um, I, they printed my entire help file which had shout outs to, you know, some of the usual suspects in, um, you know, civil rights, et cetera, but also folks who are not usually talked about, um, you know, outside of black circles and um, not talked about positively outside of black circles. And, and that kind of blew me away that I was able to just be unapologetically black in this space. And I have been ever since. You well, know. that's yeah. That that's pretty powerful in and of itself. We share that in common. I started in technology in the 1978, although I'm only 19. It was in 1978. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and 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 almost similar. Um, a white man was standing outside, you know, the college I was getting ready to go into, and he said, "Hey, we're trying to bring uh, Negroes into computing." Mm -hmm. I didn't know what either one of those words meant because the up uh, the N word I was familiar with had more G's than that word had in it. And uh, I didn't know what computing was, you know, and I was, I kept walking and he yelled, he said, we'll pay you $30,000. I never went to school. I, I came back to him and that's how I got into computing. And as you have said, you know, what I found, found interesting about technology was the lack of people that look like me, even to this day, it's still a male, white male dominated field. And also, as you say, you know, they don't recognize what we have contributed to these industries. So, you know, every time I see a ring doorbell commercial, I think about the black woman who first create, created the first doorbell. And, you know, you've got all these things, 
monitor. You know, half the things that we use today in technology, black people had a footprint in them and we don't recognize that. And, and a lot of people call teaching about black facts and black history indoctrination. I disagree with that. I don't think, I think that people should know that we are as much a part of this society and what it is as any other group, you know? And I, I think the other thing you said, to be unapologetically black should not be ashamed of it because for so, so long, and I can admit this even at myself, I thought there was something wrong with me. You know, my thick lips, you know, my hips, you know, all of these things, my hair, you know, I didn't fit into what society said was good and beautiful. I was, you know, a black woman. And I struggled with that, you know, I mean, I, I didn't know how to cope with that as a young person. And now as an adult, you know, an old adult at that, I am now trying to, with these diversity chats, is to empower people to see that whoever you are, it's okay to be that thing. And if you don't love it, no one else will. You know, and that's what I hope to happen with my chats. But, but let me go back to this. So in, in the work that you did, and you know, you wrote this program and it, you know, had wide success and all of that. How did you come to Black Facts? What made you pursue this? And what's your ultimate goal with Black Facts? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm laughing because, yeah, yeah, a lot of, a lot of times, a lot of things I don't have like a, a deep, you know, uh, um, story about. So while I... Um, while I viewed the idea of history as I, I call it the 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 um, I, the black Barbie doll effect, um, you know, old stories about you know kids picking the wrong dolls, etc. Um, because I was a nerd, am a nerd still, proud proud to be none, um, who was seeing that this technology thing was wide open, you could do whatever you want. Um, I believe that unless we saw ourselves reflected in the technology, we were not likely to embrace it. And so, you know, there was a sequence of, of technology projects that I did, um, which, you know, I had the foresight to document everything. So I actually have a personal website, kengranderson.com, that has everything that I'm mentioning. I've got, you know, um, screenshots, news stories, TV segments, and all this sort of stuff. Um, you know, so in 96, I got together with like a half dozen other Black tech entrepreneurs up in Boston, you know, which ironically is easier to do then than it is today. Um, and, and we did the first version of putting our communities online. And that was like really exciting, et cetera, et cetera. Because of some things that were happening behind the scenes, I ended up um, becoming, as far as I know, the first of what Microsoft calls a most valued professional. So this MVP thing that <laughs> I carry around, I've had since 1997, and that gave me access to all of their programming tools, including their database systems. And so I said, well, let me come up with some way to teach myself how to do database-driven websites. Let me look for a project. And there was a, a short list of today in Black history things that was circulating on CompuServe in America Online at the time. So I said, you know what? Let me use that as my basis to start building a database of Black history facts. And that's what I did. So yeah, so, so the initial thoughts were giving myself an excuse to a project to work on so I could learn how to do websites that ran on databases you know then you know later on like when we did roxbury.com in 2002 you know that was the the most expansive database driven project that we did at the time because that had news events directories and discussions and all you know but yeah the initial you know the the, the origin story of black facts you know was um yeah, yeah, looking for an opportunity to do a you know a look up searchable you know kind of kind of database as well as when did when did you launch Black Facts? Um, in ninety seven. If you if you go to the what's called the Wayback Machine web.archive.org, you can look it up and you can find pages you know back to nineteen ninety seven. I don't remember if we did it February one or <laughs> but <laughs> you know but you'll see there with our Kinte Claw look and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah. 
so where where are you now? So what what is Black Facts today, and how do you market it, and how do you draw attract attraction to the site? Um, well, yeah, today it is a well, as far as we know, the the internet's the largest single source of Black history content because um, back in 2017 to twenty eighteen. I um, built an engine that grabs Black historical content from all, online. Um, and we also started pulling news. We pulled news headlines from about 210 sources in 35 countries. About 18 of them are predominantly Black countries. Um, and then in 2020, my, um, Dale, my, my partner Dale, came up with the brilliant idea of starting to create short videos to explain Kwanzaa. And that led to historical series. And, we, and so we've got now about close to 800 videos. And, you know, so we've got, I think, three different Juneteenths and Black Wall Streets and, you know, an America, um, American Black History series from 1619 to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And, you know, um, about a half dozen ancient African empires and, and what we call our Black Facts Minute or Black Fact of the Day, which is a short video for every day of the year. As far that's as I can wonderful. know, that's the only place you can find a video for every day of the year. If you go to blackfacts.com, you'll see that. And we, you know, we, we haven't really aggressively promoted it as much as just been around so long that if you Google or Bing, you know, Black Space Facts, you'll see we're number one up there. Um, We've got about 200,000 social media followers on Facebook and uh, mostly Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, and um, LinkedIn. You know, we, we have been, we had been struggling for a while to figure out a business, you know, because we give away the content for free and we're always going to give away the content to the public for free. But we were trying to figure out a way to make it support itself. And so with the, videos and a, a, a sort of a, a special for teachers kind of system to that lets them search and download our videos you know that's become our product you know to subscribe uh, where we, we have a subscription for schools for very very low cost if you've got like a thousand students or more um and yeah and so, yeah so we're just trying to work our way through learning how to deal with schools because every state or municipality sometimes have their own vendor processes. So, you know, we're, you know, we're working, we're working through that. So I have a couple of suggestions that might be worth considering. Um, have you talked to the people at the Smithsonian? When I started doing my chats, um, somebody connected me to them and, um, you know, they listened to, you know, maybe 20, 30 of them. And uh, they said, this is really good material. You know, we would like to find some way to do something with it. I didn't pursue it. And I don't think they followed up with me after they didn't hear from me. But maybe your content might be, especially with the African-American Museum now, there might be a need for this to be somewhere. The other thing um, I was thinking about, so you are familiar with the Equal Justice Institute in, in Alabama? Um, no, um, I mean, I mean it, what's, what's interesting is that while we put out history, you know, we're not historians, educators, and we're not really connected with different organizations. We're a couple of guys who, you know, do tech and, you know, and we love to meet folks who, who can help tell the stories and, you know, and then get things out there. Well, I think your material that you have recorded would be something that would be of value to the Smithsonian regards to whether you are, you know, you know, historians or anything like, I think they would, the information would be valuable. The thing that I was saying about, um, you know, ways to make it, you know, more stand on its own financially. What about a calendar? You know, so the Equal Justice Institute, you know, that you, you can go visit all these historic sites. So they have almost a complete replica of the ship, uh, you know, the people who got off, who jumped off the ship when they were coming over. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It's traumatic to go there. I mean, especially as a black person, you just see that it's very traumatic. But they have a calendar, they have coffee cups, they have keychains that have facts on them, right? So, you know, what happened in 1619 or you know who this person was, just really interesting things. So you might consider something like that. And then the other thing I'd like to connect you to um campus consortium. Um, they are um 
Are you familiar with edge of cards? No, no, I guess, I guess it. so yeah. So well, edge of cards is an institution that helps higher ed. You know, they work specifically in the higher ed space. And so they put on conferences, they have a, a huge database of resource for technologists, you know, it's just huge. And then there's campus consortium, they do the same thing, but they work through the entire spectrum of education from higher ed all the way down to elementary ed. Um, and the president is a wonderful guy, and he's always talking about ways to bring more information to the forefront. So I think that would be a good person to speak to. But, you know, like your T-shirt, you know, where can we buy a T-shirt like that? Where can we get a T-shirt like that? You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Our, yeah, this is one of two designs we have. This is a well-worn Harriet Tubman 20 design. The other one is a collage of folks. But on, on the website, blackfacts.com slash swag. Um, you know, we have, we also have mugs. We, we actually, I, I, I built a, a little e-commerce subsystem under the hood that can actually generate, um, and then we're using a digital printing company where we can generate from any picture and, and words, you know, different designs. And we actually plan to do it at some point, whether it's, you know, a collage of, pictures of black folks born on your birthday or slogans or whatever. We're not trying to move forward on those yet because it's two guys behind this operation and we're way overcommitted. And something like that, we figure once we grow our visibility and you know, that then it'll it'll be more likely that it would lead to self-sustainability. Because there have been things that we've put a lot of effort into that because we didn't have critical mass nothing ever came of them and we can't really afford to um you know to to take those risks well let me sign up to help um you know i am happy to be a participant and help along the way but i think that it would be really helpful for you to do these things and once we post this this gets posted to youtube facebook all those places you know and so i think you'll get more especially if we could include information where they can reach you, you'll get more in interest in this might help in that area as well. But but I want to go back to something you said um, earlier about Black entrepreneurs. And I want to ask you this. So um, as you know, um, getting investors to invest in what you're doing is it's a, it's a monumental work. And sometimes that becomes a barrier for Black and Brown people to think about entrepreneurial things because like you just said, you have a great idea. You have these great t-shirts that would be really great. Would probably, you know, carry you. I was at a restaurant uh, about a month ago and a woman had on a shirt, a, a sweatshirt that said black women matter on the side of her thing. I went to the website and I bought almost everything they had on the website. And I only did that from seeing one person with that shirt and, you know, light colors, bright colors, you know, just really nice. And they have other kinds of things on the bottom of it. Just really, really interesting. And, you know, I don't know whether the, I had never heard of that, that organization until I saw that woman with that sweatshirt on. So, you know, a lot of times exposure comes from this thing, but getting the money to start something like this, to do something like what you're doing and then it, to get it to be sustainable requires, you know, financial and, 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 uh, legs on the ground support to help get these things off the ground. And so a lot of times finding Black people who are willing to invest in Black things or finding white people or other ethnicities that are willing to invest in Black ideas is hard. So how do you suggest we tell people who are interested in becoming an entrepreneur in the tech field, how do you suggest they get started? You know, so from what your experiences are, what advice would you have for them? Well, that's funny because that that's one of my kind of hot button, you know, topics and whatever. Um, and and just so you know, I'm a very I've always been since my teens a very independent thinker. I do not follow trends. I don't buy into things. And so when it comes to that, it's like you know what, um, you know, nobody ever told me that you needed investors, and none of the entrepreneurs that I've known, um, except maybe one, have ever gotten any investment money. So I just kind of call BS on this whole idea that investors are required to do anything. I'm not sure, I, I call it, you know, I, I, my thought is maybe it's, it's what I call the cult of Shark Tank, because it seems to me only in the past couple of decades has this idea come up that, oh, you got to get investors, investors, investors. I don't know of any folks that I knew growing up, who whether they had shops or things like that, you know, 
that had investors. If you can get it, great. But and certainly having money is, you know, having other people's money makes everything easier. Sure, but the reality is, and I, I know this because I just have been in, I'm in these conversations a lot, and I looked at some stats recently. I think it'd be the SBA or some other that literally, like, like I think it's like 005 percent of of you know businesses get quote venture money, which is where so many people pay so much attention to. But venture capital is generally only interested in like the next Google or Facebook, they really, you know, it's like rich folks trying to get richer by putting money in, in the next IPO or whatever. So that's not the reality. But 99.9% of businesses, you know, um, so yeah, yeah. So my thought, you know, is, you know, hey, consider that, you know, it seems to me that in most societies that have had economies for the past 6,000 years, getting investors has not been viewed as a prerequisite for starting. You know, if you need to build a factory, if you need to build buildings, oh, sure. But I started with getting a second phone line. <laughs> you know, you know, the software, you know, it's an information thing. Your brain is what you use to generate the, the products and services. So you don't have to buy, you don't need large investments of capital. So many of the tools now, unlike in the 90s, are free. So I, I just just do not buy it at all that, oh, you got to get investors. And, you know, but um, if everything is free or there are other ways to do these things, still tell us what path would you suggest users take if they're interested in, in, in becoming an entrepreneur um, and, and getting off the ground? Yeah, um, I would suggest, you know, certainly what we did. Remember, I, I said that, you know, we we're there's some things we don't we give away the content, right? So that's business to consumer. You know, we don't have a plan right now for monetizing that, you know, because in the 90s, around the mid 90s, the concept of free software came out and that's, you know, taken over. It is very difficult um, from what I've seen, unless you're one of a tiny number of folks in, in, you know, very tiny segments of industries like games, you know, where people are used to, regular users are used to spending money. You know, so many folks are, when it's something digital or music, they're used to getting it for free. And so it's hard to sell. So, so business to business is where I see the opportunities. And what we're doing with Black Facts is selling to schools. It's a, it's a, it's a business, basically. Um, so, you know, so whether you are you know, building tools that businesses are going to use or um, things that help them, you know, um, um, sell their products or promoting their products, whatever it may be, I think business to business is easier, you know, than business to consumer. And in terms of starting out, I mean, you know, it, it seems to me that some of the time honored strategies have, you know, been to use, you know, whether it's investment or building your business, friends and family, that's where you start. And if you have a product, if you're developing a product or service, you can use systems like LinkedIn, which is how we connected. And if you use them strategically and connect with people who you think are going to want your product and service and start putting information out there, that could be a way to start you know, making inroads into whatever industry you're trying to sell to. You know, so those mm -hmm. are just the thoughts that come off the top of my head. But honestly, so much of it, in my view, comes down to your mentality. You know, mm -hmm. do you, I get in these conversations and I'm just, I hear people, oh, we can't because of this, can't, you know what? And I say, I've got to where I'm like, you know what? Fine, we're good. You know, don't, you know, you know, you know, I don't have time to talk about what you can't do because I'm over here doing it and I'm gonna keep doing it, <laughs> you know, and y'all can just keep saying all the reasons why you can't do whatever, whatever, I, I, you know, as a well-known, you know, philosopher once said, ain't nobody got no time for that. <laughs> so I, I would just add, you know, if you are, if you're listening and you're interested in, in starting a business or starting in an organization or something of that nature, it is important that we consider all the pieces. I think what you said is exactly right. You know, you know, business to business or business to consumer, 
I don't think that should be a qualifier. I think if you have a good product, get gather around a small group of people, test it on them, run it by them, get their ideas, see what they think about what you, you have to say. I will say that you have a lot of naysayers to say, oh, no, you can't do that. No, that's not going to work. If you listen to that, you will lose your 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 thought and your your goal and what's driving you to that. But you have to have some place where you have people they're not related to you. You can have a couple of those, but not related to you. Don't have an interest in what you're doing and run your idea by. Them. You know, when you do develop a marketing plan, one of the first thing it says is to understand who's going to be your your competition and what are the issues that you have there. So if you have an idea, hold on to your idea. Don't give it up just because someone said no, that doesn't make any sense, or you shouldn't do that because that's how ideas die. What is the raisin in the sun? You know. A dream deferred is a dream that's not possible. It doesn't come to life. So in 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 reality, if you are thinking about this, you know, I think I agree with Ken. You know, you don't always need investors, but you can get small investors, get people to give you $50 or hundred dollars, you know, small amounts of money add up, you know, and you you keep doing this until you figure out how much you need to get what your what your idea is to bring it to market and whatever that might mean. Well, well, um, okay. And, and you know what, now, now to be very specific, right, when I was say, suggesting not looking at B to C, I'm talking about in the world of technology, because, you know, you know, if you, if you're making smoothies, you know, um, 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 you know, you know, you know, you're a contractor doing any other kind of business, but technology, people are happy to spend money, regular users, it is in technology, because we've been programmed in the past 20 something years oh, it's free, it's free, it's free. Things like Facebook, et cetera. It's free, it's free, it's free. So it's very difficult in that free mentality to say, okay, I have this product, this software, pay me. You know, you know folks, folks get ready to boycott Facebook when they hear a rumor, they're going to charge $5 a month, the 24 by 7, 365 access, but they don't want to pay that same $5 that they give to Starbucks every day. Don't, you know, you know, you know. So, so I was speaking specifically around technology for that. You know, um, one of the things that I had heard of, but only recently had started learning that I would encourage anyone starting a business is um, something called the lean startup um, um, approach. It's like a, a, a canvas that has nine blocks that talk about different aspects of the business. I thought about that when he said, think about all the pieces because myself and most of the folks that I know who have been like grassroots entrepreneurs, we're craftspeople, not business people. We have an idea, we make something, we know how to create or produce something that you know we think we can sell and we just jump into it that way. And we don't think about these other aspects. So you talked about you know getting information from people. Absolutely. You know, um many of the 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 other side of the coin or other edge of the sword of being very confident and not saying, not listening to the naysayers is that you can end up buying into your own hype and thinking that you, you know, whether it's, you know, best things to slice bread, cat's meow, whatever, that, oh, everyone's going to love this. If I build it, they will come. Uh-uh, don't work like that. You know, lean startup, um, some of the philosophy behind that suggests that if you're a startup business, you know, you're testing your hypotheses. You know, you, you know, and you're you're uh, looking for a a sustainable model that works, not necessarily going on an ego trip and look, oh, how what a good boy am I? That ain't that ain't how it works. You know, you you got to make sure that you are solving people's real problems, and the best way to find out about that is to ask them. <laughs> so, so absolutely, yes, yes. Um, I would heartily endorse, you know, systems like the Lean Startup or the Lean Canvas, you know, as a framework to think about the different moving parts in a business and then, you know, and, and work on that. And then last thought, you know, while I'm not, not thinking about relying on investment, you know, there are venues, um, you know, like crowdfunding, we actually did a crowdfunding campaign with fundblackfounders.com. You know, they got a wonderful program, um, you know, that, that, that walks you through everything you need to know at another level. Um, there's called regulation crowdfunding that requires um, um, some financial documents and things like that. And there's a group um, called the Black 10K Project that 
Um, their, their vision is to get 10,000 black folks together to put a hundred dollars into a business and fund it for a million dollars. You know, so they, you know, you know, so fund black founders and the black 10 K project are two, um, um, <laughs> interestingly, both women run, um, initiatives who, who, oh yeah, yeah. Your sister's holding it down. Uh, Take, takes a lot of us a little longer many times to, to get it together. But, you know, yeah, yeah, but yeah, but those are two um, approaches, you know, two groups that I heartily endorse, you know, for that. But at the same time, you know, I still encourage, don't expect it, rely on it or whatever, you know, you know, um, you know, if you can get something out there and show you have something that also puts you in a better position for folks to take you seriously as an investment risk because you're asking people to risk their money. Yeah. 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 You know, and me personally, I would never ask anyone to invest in something I wouldn't put my own money into, you know, and I would hope that folks would use that same sort of approach to make sure that they've dotted their I's and crossed their T's before they're asking folks for money, you know, unless they're saying, Hey, I really don't know how this is going to work out. This is an, you know, I'm going out on faith. That's cool too. If you're honest with people. Yeah. You know, well, I, I really appreciate that. This has been a very helpful conversation. I've learned a lot about your organization and I can't wait to go explore it and get my Black Facts Matter t-shirt, my Black Facts Matter coffee cup, you know, my keychain. I cannot wait for all of those things. But thank you so much for agreeing to chat with me. I hope you will chat with me again soon. Keep me posted in what's going on with you. Um, and I really appreciate this. It's very, very uh, informative, very, very helpful. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me and, and, and um, you know, happy rest of Black History Month. And for, for those of us who celebrate Black History every day, you know, happy, happy life. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We're Black every day of the year, not just in February. Right, right. And, and you know what? There's a quote that, not a quote that I made up, but one that I, I'm surprised I never heard of that is so, resonates so important, so much to me. It's a Marion Wright Edelman. Um, I can't, I'm not going to be able to quote it completely. Maybe it says, be a good ancestor. You know, take time to do something that's greater than yourself, you know, on your sojourn on this earth. Absolutely. Um, hold on just one second, please. Okay.